Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Thank you for your patience. We are a few moments late starting because we had PowerPoint failure, but hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, so yes, I'm Tony Collis. Welcome to the Archer webinar where we're going to be talking about challenges and opportunities and diversifying your workforce. Um, so the first thing I want to start with, um, although I want to emphasize the importance of diversification and um, how to go about that, I want to start off with how we got going. Um, women in HPC, which is the primary focus of today's talk, simply because that's where I have started in terms of diversity work in HPC, really came about because we looked around and realized that nobody else was doing this. This is really focusing on the work that Archer has been doing with women in HPC. Archer in 2013 set up women in HPC. I'm going to give a little bit of the reasoning behind setting it up, what we've been trying to do, and then hopefully I'm going to motivate why we all need to take some ownership of this. And I would emphasize that although I'm focusing on gender here, it's the thing that I have worked on for the last four years, I recognize that diversity goes beyond, well beyond just gender. There are overlaps, but there are also differences, and I hope this just motivates all of us to step up and have a look at what's really going on. So, women in HPC started with a question. How many women are there in high performance computing? Back in 2013, when I started to look around and ask this question, because I realized that I was in the minority, this came from a very personal place for me. Um, I realized that despite the fact that academia in the UK works extensively through programs such as Athena Swan and Project Juno to, ca to um, measure demographics and um, universities have a, a duty to report undergraduate and postgraduate admissions to places like the Higher Education Statistics Authority, otherwise known as HESA, nobody was looking at HPC. It falls between the cracks. It has historically been an area where everybody is a physicist or a chemist or an engineer or a another first, and they happen to do high performance computing. Now, in my mind, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be looking at it because if all the physicists out there that come into high performance computing are male, we're missing talent. It doesn't matter that there are physicists that are female. It what matters is high performance computing at this point. So that led me to forming women in HPC, um, which we refer to as WHPC because it's its uh, acronym. Um, that was really the motivation behind it. But then the question became, well, what do we do? I've decided to step up and do something, but, but what now? And really, women in HPC breaks its job down into three questions. How many women are there? How do we improve the proportion of women in HPC? And crucially, the thing a lot of people forget, how can we retain a diverse community? Retention is just as important as recruitment. If you do not address retention, there is no point in addressing recruitment because they'll come and they'll just leave. So you're not fixing the problem. So those of you joining the call today are probably here because you believe in this on some level. You've come along because you already have some interest. So the next couple of slides really are for your ammunition because one of the classic comments you get, thankfully few and far between, are why do we bother? What's the benefit? Why should we invest in this? A lot of the stuff that I'm going to advocate that we should be doing is non-zero effort and therefore costs money because time costs money. So this is some ammunition for you to take away and talk to your colleagues about. And this is really the way to build a, a group of people that can get behind initiatives and give you funding if you decide to do some activity. Key benefits. We can address the workforce, for, uh, workforce shortfall. Um, in the US, Canada, and Europe, there is a huge workforce shortfall estimated by mid-2020s. Depending on exactly which set of statistics you look at, it, it varies. It's a predicted workforce shortfall. And this is across the entire IT sector, so not just HPC, admittedly. But given that HPC is a growing part of the IT sector, um, more and more businesses are actually buying time um, that use services that are parallel in some form or other. These 
technologies are now beginning to permeate everywhere. So we are a growing part of the general IT sector and we are already struggling to recruit. And then you couple that with the fact it's growing more rapidly than the IT sector, which is also growing more rapidly than any other sector. And how do you, how do you recruit enough people? Particularly if you only recruit from one small part of the population. The other big ones are things such as improved team IQ and innovation. There are extensive studies done that show that when you work as a team, your team IQ is higher than the um, maximum IQ of any individual in the team. We've seen that historically. Now, more than ever, you look at research and academic papers and they're almost entirely dominated by teams. You don't see a paper by one individual anymore, not like you used to a couple of decades ago. On top of that, we know that if your team is diverse, the team IQ goes up even more. So teams are good, diverse teams are even better. Having diversity in your team generates innovation, new ideas, um, and challenges the status quo. If everybody in the team behaves in the same way because they've all been brought up in the same way, they've had the same experiences thus far, they're less likely to think about problems in different manners and therefore address issues. A diversity in your team breeds innovation. That goes hand in hand with the evidence that you get higher citation rates for things such as patents. There is some growing evidence that actually citation rates for diverse paper, papers written by diverse teams are also going up. It's less concrete so far because it's very hard to monitor. It comes, the increased team IQ comes out in, in business as well, where businesses are reporting a 17% increased return on equity when there's at least one female board member and a 14% increased return on equity for companies that have over 15% women in senior management compared to companies with just with less than 10%. That is a very small change in the number of women, 10 up to 15%, and yet you can increase a business's um, return on equity by 47%. And this is the way to convince our skeptics that this is worth paying attention to. So one of the things that Women HPC did is uh, we put out a community survey back in 2016 to really kind of understand what's going on. And one of the encouraging results we found was when we asked people, do you believe that a gender balanced international HPC community has a positive, no or negative effect? This was really trying to get to the bottom of whether or not people perceive this as a good thing to invest in. The great result from this is that the, the vast majority of both men and women both believe that uh, a diverse, gender diverse community is a good thing. The slightly disappointing thing is there is still some way to go to convince men more than women. There are female skeptics as well as male skeptics, but there are still significantly more men who are skeptical about this. But this is where we need to turn back to that evidence to convince these people that this is, it's not just nice, it is essential if we're going to excel. So how do we diversify our community? Well, I tell you how not to, by saying it's not our problem, the problem is down to schools, the pipeline is leaking all the way up to us, the HBC community cannot influence diversity, the problem is elsewhere. While I completely agree, and so does the evidence that it starts very young, gender is the first stereotype that children learn at just a couple of years old, and it's ingrained by the time they're 10. It, it doesn't end there. The very fact that we find that women are far more likely to leave technology jobs than their male colleagues should tell us that, and I'll come to that more in a bit. So what I would advocate is that we can do something about this. And um, one of the things that we, we did based on this was look at where the problem is getting worse. So for example, in IT, um, in 1985, 37% of um, computer science degrees were given to women. 2008, that had dropped to 18%. In the professional services of IT jobs, in 1991, 36% were held by women. In 2008, it dropped 
whereas women now make up 57% of all professional occupations. And it, um, it's still getting worse. That, it, what, that was the picture like nearly a decade ago, actually. I don't quite understand why more data hasn't been released. I will grant that it's very difficult to gather this information. Um, but it is not improving. In Europe, um, IT is the only sector that has not made improvements in diversity in the last decade. And it, this comes with lots of caveats. I'm referring to the IT sector here, and we are HPC, and we're also in academia, so we're slightly different. Um, this is the best handle we have so far for understanding our community. And I would definitely bear in mind here that this should be ammunition for us trying to gather this data ourselves. The pipeline is a problem, but the problem actually is more than just what's going on in schools. This, this slide is particularly worrying to me. The workforce is leaking. At 10 years into a career, 41% of women have left the IT sector compared to 17% of men. By the midpoint in their career, 56% of women have left, of which over half of them abandon their training. So this is not good for society either. We're spending all of this money training up these people and yet they're leaving. And, and by improving the situation, we actually are going to improve it for the men leaving as well and encourage them to stay. So it's good all round. Because we should be asking ourselves of the people that leave, men and women that leave, what is what is making them leave? And a lot of the time, the reason the men leave, the reason that men leave is actually quite similar to the reason that women leave. So if we can improve things, we improve attention across the across the board. And this is why this is our problem. If this is true in academia and in HPC, and there is growing evidence that this is extremely true in academia, HPC we don't have the data for yet, but I hope to gather that soon. If this is true, we have a big, big problem. Um, and only we can fix this. This is the point where we have to step up and say, this is our problem. We cannot blame it on education, schooling, et cetera, et cetera. We're the only people that have control of our community, the HPC community. So to understand this, um, in our community survey, we asked a question, which was whether or not the person answering the question had ever experienced discrimination themselves. Um, on a scale of one to five, a Likert scale, where five was strongly disagree. So the higher the average score, the less likely they were to report experiencing discrimination. Unsurprisingly, men were far less likely than women to report that they'd experienced discrimination. So that was good. Um, the next question we asked was whether or not they thought that they saw discrimination or whether their colleagues had been treated equally regardless of gender. You'll see here that the gap is narrowed. Although men are less likely to recognize that there is an issue, um, and there is still a statistically significant difference between the two genders, um, it is actually a lot more narrow. So, which is encouraging. And one of the things that we need to work towards if we're to change things is build buy in. And the best way to do that is to try and get these two numbers as close as possible. So irrespective of your gender, you recognize when there are issues. Now that may well sadly mean that the men's number gets worse, as in they see more discrimination, um, rather than the women's number getting better in that they see less. But actually that's still a step in the right direction because the first thing is irrespective of who you are, that you recognize when there's a problem around you. Because only when we start recognizing there's a problem around us are we going to be able to fix this. Based on this question, we asked for people to explain some of the situations they were in. And this is, this is a really enlightening bit of the survey. I sometimes get the impression that professionalism is rather narrowly defined as behave like the stereotypical white male. I will let you interpret that as you, as you wish. But I think that highlights one of the problems here as people are perceiving. Um, I think this was, I've lost my notes because I turned this into a PDF, so my apologies, but I'm pretty sure this was written by a woman. Um, my department has a weekly meeting on the topic of cosmology. One week, I brought a cosmology paper I wanted to discuss. Right after I mentioned this, a male postdoc in the group said that he wanted to discuss a paper that was not about cosmology and was therefore off topic for the meeting. 
We discussed that paper instead of the one I wanted. I felt that my suggestion was not taken seriously. Was it because of my sex, my genius status, or something else? I don't know. I haven't attended that meeting since then. Whatever else you think about this comment, and there's a lot that you can read into this, we, this is literally all the information we have. And you could discuss whether this person felt what they're feeling is right to feel this way or whatever. The thing that we have to take from it and be very concerned about is that final sentence. I haven't attended that meeting since then. Whatever else is going on, we need to figure out because they don't want to participate anymore. And this is the first step on a very lonely road which ends up in people leaving the sector. I am feeling that my personal professional progression is impeded by not granting permission to travel more, visit collaborators, publish publications, etc. when other colleagues have these opportunities. Similarly here, we don't know enough to say whether or not how much of this is true, how much is it is false. The key thing that we have to take away is what this person is really feeling. And there is growing evidence which I'm trying to really fully understand as to that women are less likely to travel than men. We don't know why exactly. It is not just down to um, it's not it's not just down to women having childbearing responsibilities because the travel issue starts well before women are having uh, children and is actually more prevalent in women that don't have families, interestingly. So what is going on here? What we do need to do is level this playing field. We need to figure out why people feel marginalized, irrespective of their um, personal characteristics, be them gender or anything else. So the opportunity. This talk is, is entitled Challenges and Opportunities. What is the opportunity here? Well, I would say it goes back to two key things which I mentioned at the beginning and I will mention again and I will probably mention multiple times during this next hour. It comes down to two points, recruitment, getting in a diverse community, encouraging them to take part, making them feel like they belong, and then retention, making sure that they experience things in the right way. And, and equality is not necessarily treating everybody the same. That's a mistake we sometimes make. I don't want to be treated exactly the same as somebody else. I have different needs. And I think that's something we all need to recognize if we're going to fix the retention issue. But the number one thing is we need to monitor both of these two things. We need to monitor how many people are coming in, of what types, what demographics, and we need to then monitor them leaving and to see if we're retaining in the same proportion. So what can we do? This is all about the opportunity. Well, I want to give you a couple of things that we've done here in Edinburgh in collaboration with other groups. One of the um, starting points for women in HPC was working with the International HPC Summer School, which is a collaboration between Prace, Exceed, Riken, and Compute Canada, run every year in the summer. Um, it is either held in Europe or the US, and it changes each year. In 2015, I was um, privileged enough to work with uh, the XSEED group on their review process. This came about because of anecdotal comments from people that the female attendants were nowhere near as good as the male participants of the summer school. So our, um, the work that we did looked at four parts. We reviewed the applicants. What was actually going on? How were the reviews done? Uh, was there really a difference in the in the scores of male and female applicants? Then there is a pre-survey. So the pre-survey is given to the applicants for the summer school who are successful. So they are coming to the summer school guaranteed, and we send them this pre-survey to help assess their abilities. Um, and although we don't make it clear to the students that this is what's going on, we then actually use that to put them in tracks. And it's either, a, um, again, we don't call them this, but it's actually an introductory track covering basic parallelism concepts such as that you would see in MPI and OpenMP, and a more advanced track which talks about new technologies and how to use CUDA and OpenACC. Um, and so this pre-survey is really important into making sure that the students get the appropriate um, experience in the summer school. 
We then also took a, a survey of the reviewers to see what they thought, and we performed an on-site mini-test of the attendees to figure out how good were they really. So, the first thing we did was to look at the ratings that the reviewers were giving the male and female applicants. So we did find that there was a statistically significant um, difference between the male and female ratings. On a scale of one to seven, where seven is excellent, you will see that men on average were scored higher than women. And uh, there's a probability that is statistically significant of 0.1%. So this is a big deal. Um, there is a difference, which was reflected in the staff. The staff were saying the women are not as good as men. Um, and they actually were quite worried about that. We put out the pre-survey. Um, prior to this work, the pre-survey used a lot of ratings which were self-rating people's expertise. We asked the students, you know, what is your expertise on MPI from novice to expert? When you ask this question, 55% um, of these items were rated significantly higher by men than women. Men are rating themselves higher when you ask them their expertise. When you ask instead how frequently they use something, there is no difference. Now, we're not saying that frequency is necessarily the best um, alternative to uh, expertise rating, but we know from other literature that men are far more likely to say that they're better at something than women are with the same level of experience. So identifying that this was an issue and that this was then being used to actually put these people in tracks was meaning that no women were participating in the advanced track of the summer school, which actually then encourages the attendees to um, feel that there's a difference between the attendees as well. None of the women are good enough to be in the advanced track because however much they tried to hide the fact that the staff referred to it as advanced track, it got out. The students were fully aware of what was going on there. <clears throat> so what was the next innovation? Well, the direct assessment that we handed out, and this is with a multi-choice set of questions on um, parallelism concepts, basic ideas, whether they understood basic principles of HPC, whether they recognized what an MPN, MPISN does and things like that, we found that there was no gender difference. Um, when we asked the reviewers to give us feedback, so this was before they saw this result of the direct assessment, we got some interesting feedback. Unfortunately, the pool of female applicants was a small and maximally qualified, i.e. selected females did not appear to come up to the level of the maximally qualified males. I worry if the difference in preparation between males and females will be visible to the students at the event, and this so whether it will have a negative reinforcing effect on the minority position of the women in HPC. This was really quite worrying to us because we knew at this point that the female applicants were just as well qualified as the male applicants. And yet the staff, the reviewers, are, are asserting that they are concerned about the lack of qualification of the women. Um, and this will, this will come across. However hard we try human beings, we are not perfect, and therefore these things will come across. What was also very interesting in the reviewers' scores was when we asked questions where anything to do with gender, we found on average that the scores were always lower. As soon as gender was involved in the situation, the score was lower. So you see here, there are three questions. And the first and the last question that I show you have a lower score. And this was consistent. As soon as the question had anything to do with gender, the score was lower by the reviews. This is the reviewer survey. Another response we got. I don't think we deliberately treat them indifferently, but I think it's very easy for us to implicitly assume that a decent female student will take a more applied path while we force her male colleagues to start programming. We actually disproved this one. So this was the perception that women are far more likely to come from computer science background, whereas the women were more likely to have come from a biology or a chemistry and engineering, and therefore that was one of the reasons why they didn't know as much. In this particular year, we actually found that more of the female candidates were from a computer science degree rather than from an applied um, degree such as physics that uses HPC. So we're, make, we're finding here that our reviewers are making assumptions. 
<clears throat> so what do we do? Um, in response to this, the first thing we did was educate our reviewers. We showed them all this data. The reviews are now double blind. Um, and since we introduced that, this is now three years later, um, there are no real differences. Um, there, there is statistically no difference between the ratings of the male and female applicants. The pre-assessment has moved away from using novice and expert and is instead focuses on frequency and we're finding far more women are participating and enjoying the more advanced work. The really exciting thing here has been that the staff have dropped this perception that the female students are somehow less able which is actually changing the way that they treat the female students as well, which is really, really important. Because however hard we try, if we're treating people differently, which we will be doing if we think they're less able, that will rub off on the students. And we're building another generation with this unconscious bias that's right there from day one. So this is, this is an exceptionally important, just from not just from the um, participation of women and their experience, but also from what it's going to do to that body of people is they mature and take over these roles in leadership and running their own summer schools. We're, this is the first step in really changing it for the next generation and crucially making sure that we can then retain those people as well. So one of the other things that I've done with Archer is to look at the training program. So as many of you may well know, Archer runs a lot of training courses, many of them face-to-face. -face. And we looked a couple of years ago at the training. We split them into three levels. Um, level one, which is things such as um, an introduction to Archer, the hands-on introduction, MPI, etc., And then all the way up to level three, which is the really advanced MPI stuff that we teach. What you'll see here, which probably doesn't surprise many of you, but it's the first time anybody quantified it, is that unsurprisingly, women are participating at a lower level the more advanced the training becomes. This is in line with work that the um, Software Sustainability Institute has done, which has seen the same sort of fall off. Um, and it goes some way to explain the differences in, in conference participation, where at supercomputing, which is the largest um, international conference on HPC, and it's very broad remit, we have 13% women. Whereas when we ran PGAS, which is a very niche conference, there were just a handful of women involved. I think it came out at something like 3%, and all of the women involved were actually local to the organizers. So there is something going on here. Why are women not participating in advanced training? One of the innovations we've done, we have not solved this problem, by the way, but one of the things we did do was introduce women in HPC branded training. Now, I will admit, <laughs> I was a skeptic here. I'm a physicist. I've been surrounded by men my entire career, and well before that, I was like, I, I wouldn't want to attend women in HPC training. But I thought it was worth a go. So we've now done, I think, five courses. We started off with the introduction to HPC, which some of you may well have attended. Um, and this really is a very basic course. It's the basic concepts of how to log in, how to use Archer. It's back to basics. The really fascinating thing that when I ran this course the very first time was that the women who attended it, actually much of the time, they already knew all the material I was talking about, which was striking to me. Um, they didn't actually need to be there, but they didn't have the confidence to attend. Before we ran the course, we also made sure we had predominantly female staff involved, and I think all but one of our courses have been only female staff, which you can have a discussion about whether that's right or wrong. This is an experiment. I mean, at the end of the day, most of our courses are run entirely by male staff, so is actually having all female staff a bad thing, you could ask? So that's a question for another day. Um, and we also looked at the material. We try to go through the material and remove gendered metaphors, analogies, and examples, pictures of people. If it's not relevant, it doesn't need to be in there. I know I'm terrible for referring to supercomputers as he. So one of the things that we need to do is move away from that because this just builds our unconscious bias. We hear he, 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 computer, computer, computer. We build that unconscious bias whether we like it or not. It's human nature. And so we need to move away from these things and stop associating technology with men. 
and that's one of the best ways to break down these biases. So well, some feedback from the training. This was really eye-opening to me because as I said, I was a skeptic when I started this. I did it as an experiment. I think a lot of the ladies attending were overqualified for this course. Many of them seem to already have quite a lot of experience in HPC and were therefore beyond needing an introduction. It was less intimidating signing up to this course knowing it would be mostly women. I really appreciate that this course was for women. It allowed us to interact in a more relaxed environment. The fact that it was aimed at women meant that there was a less pressured and a competitive environment. I felt less embarrassed to be stuck or confused as everyone was so kind. There was a negative to all this though. The experience that they had was intimidating. And at times I felt that people were talking shop and using jargon that I didn't understand. So I felt left out of some of the conversations happening during breaks. Now, this was the very first version of this course I ran, and I know exactly what happened here. I picked up early on that basically the majority of the women in this room knew what they were doing. They didn't need to be on this course. They needed to be on the next course up. So I just upped the game. I just went, okay, let's move on to this. What I had completely missed is that I was leaving somebody behind, and I did not realize that until I saw this. Um, and I think that's telling, actually, because one of the reasons, and uh, having spoken to many people since I started doing this about why they come to these sessions, is it's really intimidating when you're the only woman in the room putting your hand up and saying, hey, I don't understand. It's bad enough if you're in the majority. It's a whole different kettle of fish when you're in the minority. And I always like to tell an, a funny story here about one of my colleagues. When I started Women in HPC and I was running an event at a conference um, and he was super supportive, really, really engaged in what we're doing. And he turned up, he turned up early before I turned up. He walked into a room full of women and he told me afterwards, he was so intimidated that he walked out again and waited for me to turn up. He'd never in his entire career experienced a room full of women. And I think for most of the women who were in our community, We've forgotten actually what it's really like to walk into a room full of men. It's just now part of every day. But I tell you what, teaching a room full of women, as much as I was a skeptic, is a very different experience from teaching a room full of men. And the other fascinating thing is um, we never exclude men. We just brand it as women HPC. We really do not exclude men. And there's every single course I've run, there's always been one or two men involved. The fascinating thing is that the men are the ones who are most likely to question my knowledge as the trainer, um, which is probably one of the reasons why I find it easier to teach um, the women than the men, because I feel like I can have an honest discussion with the women and they're not you know, immediately questioning me, whereas I have felt that the men are immediately questioning me. This is something I want to find out. Is this just me or is this something that we see across the board? And I would love to see more research on this. So what else can we do? This is hard. Uh, this comes down to the fact that everybody needs to do something here. So I've, the last couple of slides are kind of what we should and shouldn't do. The first thing, and I think I've made the point here many times, is benchmark. We really need to start gathering data. And I, I talk about this a lot, um, and so many people are very excited to help. But then they send me an email two weeks later and say, so what do you need and how do I gather it? So here are some do's and don'ts. If you're going to gather data, you have to ask. You cannot just say, oh, they're male, they're female, I know them. No, you don't know that. You have to allow people to choose, and crucially, you have to offer the opportunity to opt out. The interesting thing here is if you don't make it a compulsory question, though, um, people will just won't answer it. We're all busy people. You see a mandatory survey, you answer the mandatory questions and you ignore everything else. So best practice if you're really trying to gather this data is to offer four options. Male, female, other, because gender is no longer binary. And the fourth option allows you to make it compulsory by saying prefer not to say. So it should be a four option question. And that goes for anything that you're collecting, not just gender. If it's a personal characteristic, they have to be given the right to self-declare and they have to be off, uh, off of the option to not say. Um, 
If you're going to share it with us, and we ask that you do, because the only way we're going to fix this is to really understand the wider community, understand who's coming in, who's going out, where are they going. I ask that you share numbers and percentages. I do want this data to be anonymized. But if you just send me 52% um, of our training cohort is, is male or female, that's, I cannot combine that with anything else. Whereas if you send me raw numbers, as long as they're fully anonymized, I can then start to do some sort of combination and get a bigger picture. Um, it's really useful to go just beyond you know, who your colleagues are. It's useful to look, for example, here at our, in Archer, we look at who is using our service. Uh, one of the things I want to understand is actually, are women more or less likely to use CP hours than men? Are women more or less likely to be inactive users of Archer? Are women or men more likely to be PIs, co-Is, researchers, students? Is there a difference in publication rates? If we're going to really understand our retention and our recruitment, we need to understand every single part of the pipeline. This is not about just trying to invade people's privacy. This is genuinely about trying to understand the problem that we're trying to solve. If you don't understand the problem, you run around doing stuff, you're not necessarily going to make anything better. So what else can you do? Um, <clears throat> training. Um, you probably by now, if you're in the UK, have heard of unconscious bias or implicit bias. There are two other things that are really important to explain to your colleagues. Imposter syndrome and stereotype threat. These are seminars in their own right, so I'm not going to go into them into detail. But these are things that if you raise awareness of your colleagues of these three things, one, they may well realize that they are experiencing it and therefore be able to take some corrective behavior. And for example, imposter syndrome, it can be a huge boost um, for people and of both genders to realize that this is a thing and that they're not alone. But equally, if they're educated about it, they may well recognize it in their colleagues and realize that when their colleague is not volunteering for something, there may well be a very good reason. Provide mentorship and sponsorship. One of the most striking bits of research to come out of the US in recent years is the amount that women benefit from mentorship and particularly sponsorship. Um, I, in my notes that aren't attached to this anymore, <laughs> I had all the statistics here, um, but it's an enormous ability for women to actually make the most of their careers if they have sponsorship and mentors, particularly sponsorship. Um, if you don't have a formal mentorship program in your institution, I would encourage you to set one up. I informally mentor people from all over the world, and I would encourage you to do as well. I also have mentors from all over the world. Um, whatever stage of your career, you can offer mentorship and you can be mentored, and I would encourage you to do so. Look at family-friendly working policies. Thankfully, this is something the UK does relatively well. But for example, do you allow people to go home and collect the children and then work in the evening? In this day and age, especially with the work that we do, there's no reason why we need to be at our desks to do our job. As long as you can work around meetings, and virtual meetings work very well the majority of the time, um, there is a really good case here for allowing people to be more flexible and accommodate their family requirements. And because we are still in the situation where women are just still doing more of the caring than men, that is changing, but it's a slow road. And so this is one of the ways of leveling the playing field. And if we get that leveled, it actually has the positive knock-on effect that everybody in the workforce recognizes that this is a worthwhile thing to do and that caring for your family is not something that's detrimental to your career. Attend Women HPC's events. We've just finished our events for the year. We had SC17, which we took over, um, had a, a full week of events, and uh, last week, Actually, no, earlier this week, there was an event in South Africa that's currently going on. I guess none of you are in South Africa right now. <laughs> um, but then also run your own events. So we recognize that not everybody can come to our, our events. And so we encourage you to run social events. This might be reaching out to the other women in your institution who use HPC, because a lot of the time there are, you know, maybe just a couple of women and they don't even know each other. Try and build a local network, a local group. It is surprising for many people how important a network is and that just having, if you're in a minority, only having 
people that are not like you in your network can actually be quite detrimental. So try and put women in touch with other women. And let's address our own conscious bias. Let's invite more female keynote presenters. This is tricky. Uh, I was one of the co-organizers of the Euro MPI conference in Edinburgh last year, and we set ourselves a target and we struggled. But what it did make us do was look outside our box. Rather than going to the standard MPI presenters, we found a couple of really amazing female speakers. It's hard, but that's the whole point. It's, if it was easy, we'd be doing it already. And actually what this is encouraging us to do is not overlook our female colleagues, which I found that even I was doing. There were amazing women I knew in this area and I just didn't even think of them as presenters for some reason that I cannot fathom. Look at how you run conferences and events. Archer has published a really great guide to diversifying your conferences, all the way from appointing somebody to really focus on diversity, because you know what, the first thing that drops off your radar when you're stressed and trying to run a conference on top of your day job is the things that are nice, such as diversity. So appoint a diversity chair. Set yourself targets and goals. You don't have to meet them, but if you don't know what you're aiming for, you're not gonna meet anything. Look at your presenters, as I've already said. Look at how you run the conference. So one of the things I did with SC17 is we brought back the prayer room and a lot of people were asking, why do we need a prayer room? Well, I tell you what, it was used every single day by over 30 people. It was needed. And it's made a huge difference to the welfare of the people who did use it in terms of their attendance of the conference. Finally, to conclude, if I've not said it enough, I'll say it one more time. To improve diversity is a two-part problem. You need to look at recruitment and you need to look at retention. We need to go out there and be ambassadors and make sure people realize that this is not just a problem for uh, somebody else to deal with. It's not just in schools. It's not just eight-year-olds. It's not just 13-year-olds. This is a problem that the HPC community, which is a very unique community in that it sits across every traditional academic subject, but above them as well, in that you only really get to it once you've gone through university. So this is our problem to own, and therefore our problem to solve. Uh, and if there's one thing that you take away, that should be it. Um, I'd like to finish by thanking a couple of people who've contributed content for this talk. Athena Franzana, my PhD student, Lorna Rivera at Georgia Tech, the International HPC Summer School, the FC Conference Series, Grace Archer and EPSRC who all make women in HPC possible. Thank you very much. Um, if there's one more thing that you can do, it is go to the Women in HPC website and irrespective of your gender, join www.womeninhpc.org slash membership or just go to Women in HPC and there's a button at the top right that says join. Membership for individuals is free and we need male participation. This is about the underrepresentation of women. It's not just for women. We do things other than just for women as well. We focus on that. That is in our name. But diversity is more than just gender. It just happens to be 51% of the population is female. So it's an easy target for us to start with. And you can also join in the conversation on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And this really is a community initiative. Um, so thank you ever so much, and I hope you found this useful. I'm happy to take questions if anybody has them. No questions? Okay. In which case, I believe that we are done. So thank you very much for joining in the conversation here and listening here today. Um, and please stay in touch with us and let us know what you think. Thank you very much. <laughs>